Hey guys, how you doing? Welcome back to the Art House. So we're going to do a one take, one take market assessment talking about all of the different categories of sorcery contested realm. No editing, just my thoughts for what it's worth and perspective on how I perceive the market. We've had a lot of good discussion about this in the Collector Art House Discord. And it's very interesting looking at the different dynamics of sorcery, which are unique in many ways. And we'll talk about that case by case as we talk about the different collectible and player item categories and some of the market dynamics that kind of um, affect that. You know, in a Discord, we're talking about um, some of the unconventional supply situations we've seen, the release cadence, how all those factors affect the valuation of things, uh, the challenge actually in evaluating things and the challenge in projecting kind of the future state of the game. So let me switch the cameras here. And what I have on the desk are several different items of different collectible categories. I'm going to start with, let's talk about sealed product, right? So what I have here is a alpha box and um, that is open. I just have this for show. This is a box I had open on the channel. On the back, you see the Eric's Curiosa card, which changed in the beta. And then of course there is the alpha symbol here. So the alpha sealed product, this is what came out with the Kickstarter. I think at the moment of this recording, the price of a box is around, I'll say, $1,100 to $1,200 on average, right? You can find these on the different marketplaces on TCG Player, and it's been pretty stable at that price point. You can get a case for probably around $7,000 to $7,200, um, so maybe, maybe a little bit uh, discounted or you know pretty comparable to the single box price depending on how you can get uh you know um, prices of single boxes in sorcery there isn't really a issue with buying single boxes versus cases when it comes to pull rates so the pull rates are really on a per pack uh basis and not so much on a per box or per case basis so it's been very interesting price have been very stable um it was a phenomenal kickstarter debut uh prices really rocketed and it took several tiers higher right it was a it was a fixed kickstarter print run so as much as was, was it was kind of like a print to demand essentially the number that bought into the print starters the number that printed it was around thirty thousand boxes which is i don't know some might say that's a lot for a debut um so some thought that there would be a retracement but there never really was price was really stable it just kept going up and up and um yeah, it's pretty interesting to see how resilient it's, it's been. I think the liquidity of sealed product is um, kind of mixed. You know, there's been a lot of uh, breaks. I've done breaks on my channel. Uh, there's been breaks on whatnot. You know, there's streamers that do that. And um, there's been pretty steady demand. I'd say in the summer here, we're kind of in a quiet lull period where the breaks have kind of slowed a bit. Uh, the interest in alpha breaks there seems to be pretty strong interest in sample packs and we'll talk about that in a moment in breaks of those but for alpha it's slowed a little bit but the price has been stable there's just not a lot of sales liquidity there's not a lot of sales activity going on except for um i guess i think what's kept the market stable and afloat is the breakers have been buying in uh case quantities and there's been enough demand for breaks that there's been enough of a value proposition for them to continue to do breaks. And that has created some stability in the market. That's that's my perspective on that. When it comes to beta, now beta is a whole new interesting beast, right? Because there has been a lot of uh, choppy supply disruption, I guess I'll call it. So the availability of the product uh, regionally across the world has been very, very mixed. So early on, when beta release, there was widely available product across all the stores that bought in and um, Team Covenant, one of the primary partners and distributors for Sorcery Contested Realm. And then very quickly, the market absorbed the demand of beta and then it was only available through Team Covenant through, I wanna say, was it December timeframe? Um, and then around that time frame, they, they mentioned that they were very low on supply and they actually announced that they ran out entirely. So the market price for beta really shot up around 250 to $300. And then it kind of stabilized back to about 250, which is where we are now. Um, once, once that product dried up and there was some announcements by the company of a reprint. So we saw a large supply interestingly enough went it's seemingly large you know based on the market dynamics of quantity of beta the new print of beta that went to singapore 
Um, so that was the first market to to get this second print of beta called Summer Beta or Summer Sorcery, as most people are calling it. And in that, a very interesting dynamic was the color saturation of the cards were significantly different. So it almost created, it was kind of a twofold thing. That was, they created two very interesting dynamics. For one, I think Eric got to experiment with the color quality, the color print quality of the cards because there was most people would say that the look and feel of alpha was significantly better than the first print of beta and then in the second print of beta the colors were largely changed the the darker colors like the blacks are a lot deeper black really stands out and then the color hues of the um the other color spectrum was very striking and different from the first print of beta so there's it created almost like a second wave of interest is very strong as we lead to our Ethereum Legends, and it created this opportunity for Eric to really, in my opinion, tune the the print quality as we come up on Ethereum Legends and make sure that that is to his liking as best it could be. So it served that purpose. And then interestingly enough, the, the print difference created almost like a, sepa, a second resurgence and um, excitement and demand for the second print of beta separate from the first print. So while the market may or may not have been saturated it's really hard to tell if the market was saturated because there was simply no supply right um, but in the second print there was quite a bit of demand and it appears to be sparked by maybe the dearth of supply the lack of supply around the world compounded by this new color um, quality for beta as people now who already had full sets are coming back for more and trying to acquire a full set of the summer sorcery which looks distinctly different and maybe have a um, set of both or, or one or the other um, so it's really interesting i was able to what what happened was a lot of quantity went to singapore and then apparently it wasn't fully absorbed there because a lot of it got sold back to the breakers the small business um, retailers different folks that wanted to um, sell you know in the u.s market so a lot of it was sold back to the u.s and then resold within the u.s I was approached myself by, by a contact in Singapore that I've done consignment for, and I've sold several paintings and um, cases of Alpha for and things like this. And he, uh, he told me he had a contact in Singapore, and he had about 50 cases of beta, summer beta. So I bought 25 cases, and I sold it to my Patreon supporters within, within a day. You know, it was like massive demand. I was really surprised. I thought it was taking a big leap of faith, um, being uncertain about the demand for that. And it wasn't like any single person bought many cases. I mean, there was a few folks that bought one or two cases, but it was very widespread. I have a little over 100 um, paid tier patrons at the moment, and um, many different people bought. Uh, dozens of people bought the product, and they bought a few boxes here and there, maybe up to a case or two. So it's people that are collecting the game or just wanted to get exposure to that new beta. And now it's going to be really interesting because there's additional supply that's going to come to original innkeeper backers from the Kickstarter, and then also to uh, stores that have been hosted in store play um, through the play network. So it's evident that um, Eric's Curiosa is targeting the support group that's been there from the beginning that's fostering in-store play trying to get product in the hands of these stores to retain their interest in sor sorcery as we come up on the ethereum legends debut and it'll be more supply and hopefully that will be a growth vector for the company as more stores can finally hopefully onboard and take an interest in sorcery because they'll have product to sell and um you know stand to profit as a small business does so that's where we're at with the beta situation there was a video by rudy which i thought was interesting where he's saying he says the second uh, the secondary market has spoken um there's a lot of demand certainly no question about that but the he, he cited the secondary market price as a sign of stabilization and health of the game although i think that kind of undersells the factor of the um i don't want to say uh inconsistent or choppy supply situation right there's all there's seemingly strong demand but no supply right which really makes the hard game hard to grow it really makes it difficult to assess a um a typical you know supply and demand open um open market where you have more supply and then you can't really test like what the demand level is when there is no supply we know there is demand but we don't know if like it's 
mostly saturated or if there's much larger demand beyond what's already out there because there's just no supply to test that theory so our theory in legends when that comes out and it's released in waves we're finally going to see that for the first time and it'll be very interesting to see what the health of the sorcery market is all right so getting into now some some old unicorn pro, um, products right so we have the sample packs these are um, sealed sample packs from different regions of the world you know some are from my kickstarter pledge some are from uh, others I've acquired along the way. So these are extremely rare. There are 244 of these in across all of the Kickstarter pledges. And then some content creators got them early on as well. So you don't really find a lot of these out in the free world. I've done a lot of sample breaks, about 25 of them on the channel, and they usually sell for about around $400 a card. So um pretty strong health I, I would say that the you know when you when you do a break at a sealed uh break level you could get about 300 to 400 per card on the open market for the singles of these it ranges wildly sometimes people dump them at the ordinary rarity level for about and i say dump like at 100 150 dollars and some people will say mike that's crazy you know you don't see that in other games but that is really the baseline minimum because the ordinary rarity sample cards, some of them are on the order of single digit population. I have a linked uh, Google sheet at collectorarthouse.com in the, in the collector's corner section under the sample cards where I have a bunch of individual sample card images shown. And at the top of that page, there's a tracker that this guy, Eric, in the Collector Art House Discord tracks. And he's tracked all of the population of pulled sample cards as best as he can find. And there are ordinary rarity cards that have only been found in single digits up to maybe 25-ish, I think, on the high end. So they're actually more rare so far than many curio cards that have been reported. And it's certainly when you get to the exceptional, elite, and unique rarity, uh, sample cards, they're, they're far more rare than the, the curio cards because they're on the order of single digits in many cases. And sometimes people will pay several thousand dollars for those, some of the really high-end ones that are very rare. So that's kind of a, a unique dynamic. They're very rare, very liquid. We don't have a lot of sales data to get a stable price history. Um, so sometimes things can be um, you know, it's really hard to evaluate because there isn't enough sales data to come up with trends you know trends of supply it can be largely controlled by a small number of passionate collectors and um, really hard to get you know kind of like a stable actual market price on things the other things getting to promo cards so promo cards are very interesting this relentless crowd crowd promo card is <laughs> and i'm seeing my screen is inverted so again we're winging it here with um no video editing so you're just gonna have to look at it inverted but the relentless crowd try reading this it almost looks like a foreign language card the relentless crowd is um one of the first early promo cards that was very difficult to acquire there's only a hundred of these printed the company declared that so we know that definitively and they were given out to early supporters of the game there were some contests early on where you could win these if you were in a discord in the ver very early days um, so this is probably the most coveted promo card in sorcery it tends to sell for anywhere from around two thousand dollars i would say on average to close to, i've seen sales up to 2.5 2.6 thousand the upper two thousands which is pretty considerable for a promo card and then early on in early days there was this sketch card with the artwork by francesca berald and the first wave of of play testers or people that gave feedback about the rules that were playing the game giving feedback on the rules um or you know any any form of feedback through this was another promotion through the discord and they awarded some of these sketch cards and eric actually the creator of the game eric olson signed each of these copies for that first wave of play testers then they had another promotion where this same promo card was disseminated without the signature right so these this is probably the second highest uh, value and most coveted card again the price points on these are very difficult to evaluate because of the illiquidity there's just not a lot of sales that happen on these a lot of people just have them in their collections for, for one there's not a lot out there and secondly secondly a lot of people keep them in their collect collections and do not offer them for sale so that's where i would where we're at with promos i would say the next tier is probably the judge promos like last year at gen con in uh, gen con 2023 
the first um, real appearance by Sorcery in, at the side session uh, gaming events. They gave people that showed up for the event, played an event, and uh, judged the event a card that had the Crown Sorcerer, like the crown from the Crown Sorcerer, in the is kind of a holographic element of the game mechanic box. And again, um, hard to find those, hard to value those, but those are probably the top three, Relentless Crowd, the Playtest card, and then that uh, the Judge promo cards. Beyond that, you have the Dust promos, you have the exclusive from Rudy from Alpha Investments, uh, Team Covenant as the top two partners. Those are not particularly rare um, because there was a large supply of those. Same with the Innkeeper Pledge promos, the Vincent Pompetti Champion card, in both the initial Alpha Innkeeper kit store kit and then the beta store kit so you know those are you know decently valued but um you know we're talking about like a couple hundred bucks or so nothing too crazy on those these are these are the top grails if you can find those uh that a lot of people desire all right then we get into i talked about individual sample cards i just had one here to show you again it's inverted apologize but it's it, the copyright symbol at the bottom signifies that that is a sample card all right um Next, let's go to curio cards, right? So the top Grail curio cards are these Alpha Curios where you have the Brahm Death Speaker, right? This is a massive, massive card in uh, Alpha. You know, the Brahm, there's only been about a dozen of these discovered so far that we know of publicly between those being tracked and then also um, there's only been like a few very few sales of these publicly known there's been uh, one that i auctioned um and it didn't quite hit reserve so i closed that deal privately after the auction and then there was one sale on ebay for about eleven thousand five hundred dollars or about eight thousand um or eighty five hundred british pounds as i recall uh so about eleven thousand the one that i sold privately i'll say sold for a few thousand below that i, I want i don't want to say the exact number because it ended up closing privately but it was a public auction on the sorcery community facebook group you should join that the link's always in the description and then also in the collector art house discord i mirror the auctions in both places and you can bid in both places and you may see this one come for sale this would be the third uh known sale i'll probably offer it privately and then perhaps as a uh maybe maybe go to auction if uh, the right offer doesn't come in but that's the grail of grails i would say there's also the um the Frank Frazetta uh, Curio card certainly is a big one, Death Dealer, and um, the Eric's Curiosa Sketch Card from Alpha. Those are probably the top three Curios. All of these value in the thousands of dollars. Um, they're just very, very rare, very, very illiquid, and you don't see them come to market that often. All right, so then you have the Alpha Curios, you know, and there's several great ones. You have the Belfry, you have the Eric's Curiosa Sketch, as I just discussed, the Grid Lord back on the back of the Francesca Brawled Sorcerer card, the nine piece curio. All of these are extremely rare. You know, they all value around a thousand bucks to 1500, I'd say. It really depends. Uh, maybe more, maybe 2000 for some of these. Bloom of Frogs and Wind Blast. All right. And then there's a few others. I don't have every single curio. I do have quite a few there, but not every one. In uh, beta, you have um, a few holographics, the first holographic curios you know that are pretty interesting and people enjoy and then the step curio is one of the big ones the um crusade and jihad uh hybrid you know so that's a that's a big card um that that's probably about a two thousand twenty five hundred dollar card or so um so you know the curios again very illiquid very rare very hard to to find those i'm not going to get into single prices so much you guys can easily go look at those on tcg player and see the trends in um, high-end cards. I would say, again, the alpha cards are somewhat illiquid. I think um, where we're at in the market is that set has been out for quite a while now. You know, So a lot of the hardcore collectors have, um, I think, achieved their collection goals or are pretty close, so they're getting pretty picky and choosy with the ones they're missing from their collection. And um, as a result of that, I think there are not a lot of new buyers at this time. And again, I think it's going to take Arthurian Legends for this market to grow. It feels fairly small, the breadth of the market right now. And I think we will see growth with new store adoption and new um, collector and player interest as we get into Arthurian Legends. And there's new, more new beta on, on the market, which will incentivize stores to get involved in the game. And then also people to play the game, people to collect the game. And then perhaps we'll see improved liquidity of the alpha market, um, then beta. 
Uh, beta, I feel, in my opinion, is more of a player set. Um, I think there was quite a bit printed of first wave. Uh, second wave is uncertain. We're still um, kind of learning those market dynamics. Um, but I think overall, there's, there's, if I hazard to guess, we don't know the numbers. The company hasn't, hasn't declared it. But I think there was a large quantity of beta printed to try to get into the players' hands. But interestingly, the demand has been very strong. So um, I, it's unclear, you know, how many people are playing. There's not a good way to gauge a metric for that. Uh, playing versus hoarding the product, you know, as a speculative investment or whatever um, people want to do. But that's where we're at with uh, sealed product and singles. And then we get into artist proofs. So we have the East, the, oh, this one's the Heat Ray, right. So this is just an example from the great Jeff Easley, incredible iconic artist. Um, and uh, yeah, just a phenomenal uh, market category. People that are really into original artwork, they typically start with prints. You know, there, there's um, different collecting classes, I would say, or tiers um, from evaluation and pricing uh, perspective when you get into artwork. You have the regular unlimited prints, then you have embellished prints, something such as this with the pristine paradise from Marta Molina. You know, she did these embellishments uh, throughout with um, painting over top of a Geekly print of the water, adding the flamingo, um, the water coming off the birds and a waterfall and some accents on the skies. That's an embellished print. So you'd have a unlimited at the lowest end and the, the most inexpensive would be an unlimited print run of the artwork in the game. Then you would get into a uh, higher quality prints or limited quantity prints. You know, if the prints are numbered in some way as shown up to 10, 20, 30, um, then it becomes an unlimited, ex not exclusive, but an, a limited item, you know, so it tends to have a premium valuation. And then the print quality can affect the price, um, the cost input of actually doing the print and then uh, accordingly the price of the product and then over time it always comes down to supply and demand less supply but will there be demand for prints um, you know you don't see a lot of prints for resale typically at the early stages of um, a TCG and a TCG market so that's yet to be seen a lot of people just collect it because they love the art a lot of people like the limited number series some to speculate some just because it just feels more special you know that there's uh, only 10 or 30 people in the world that are gonna own a piece of that size that print quality that uh, unique touch like an embellished print like this right and you see these ones sell for about $500 from Marta Molina and then you have as I was just saying the regular numbered prints Here's the Philosopher's Stone from Severn Pinu, and this is a print series out of 30. Um, so a beautiful print, you know, large size print. I think this one is about a 12 by 18 or so. She does a lot in a 16 by 20 um, larger size in these limited series. Typically sell for a few hundred dollars. These ones are $275. Um, and then you get into... I would say, um, before I go to original paintings, you're seeing an original painting of the Zephyr and airship here. You have artist proofs and altars, right? And I think um, I didn't grab an example of an altar. There's been some tremendous altars that I've been working with at Collector Art House, uh, Vivian Calazans, Atlas Thorne, Dustin Brossard, and there's a few more to come that I'm really excited about. Um, I've really uh, been fortunate to work with a lot of incredible, amazing artists within Sorcery that are, have been commissioned for Sorcery for the game itself and for the cards. And then I've also been trying to leverage my platforms, the Sorcery Contested Realm community group, the Discord group, my Instagram, my YouTube, to showcase the work of other tremendously talented artists in the world here that um, have the ability to paint on cards. That's kind of like a entry-level way to really showcase their work. And then a lot of them aspire to do full-scale commissions, you know, for major labels, major projects, major indies like Sorcery, uh, maybe get into Magic the Gathering, get into other indies that are doing original art concepts, book covers, you know, all types of different things within within the, um, the different market space for the art market. Um, but the next tier, I would say, of original art, a lot of people go from the regular prints to embellished prints to... Artist proofs, artist proofs, or I guess uh, I would say alters. Alter. It's interesting the the market, the current market dynamics. A lot of alters are being uh, valued similarly to artist proofs, which is really, really great and exciting because it says that the market is valuing the intrinsic quality of the painted work itself, the artist, and also the intrinsic quality of the artwork. 
Um, we've seen many altars sell for several hundreds of dollars, some uh, in the four figures territory, over $1,000, um, where people are really excited about the art and they think it's beautiful, it's in their collection, an altar. The great thing about an altar is typically people will preserve the text box and then they completely reimagine, um, at least the artists I work with, I always require them to completely reimagine the entire concept, you know, to preserve the integrity of it, really not um, piggyback off of the original artist's work, but rather reimagine it in their own way and showcase their own style and their own work. And then the title and the text box, all the details of how to play the game are retained and you, you could actually play with those in your deck, which is a lot of fun. Um, but on the uh, artist proofs, these and Alpha came with square corners. One of my speculative theories is that perhaps Eric will go to rounded corners in um, the future, perhaps uh, yet to be seen. We'll see in Arthurian Legends if he does that. I think that is... Um, I think there's a potential for that because I think Eric uh, really values the element of collectability and preserving value of early adopters and people that go after the early stuff. He's an old school magic collector and player himself. So I think one way to create a special premium beyond it being alpha is perhaps go to rounded corners in Arthurian Legends. But that is yet to be seen. Uh, we don't know that to be true. It is, in any case, it's Alpha. There's only 25 of these given to the artist, 25 of each of their artworks. There were no artist proofs for promo cards um, or curio cards or any special category cards outside of those that are in the booster box as non-foils um, in the core Alpha set, the 403 cards in the core set, right? Um, and then you have uh, a blank back on these and then typically the artist will either ink sketch on the back or they'll do a painting. So here's one by Jeff Easley. And um, the typical price point on these, on the low end, they usually sell for $400, I would say. And they also can go up to uh, four figures, certainly. We've seen many go over $1,000. This one, I think, sold for $1,400 recently at auction at the Sorcery Community Facebook group and the Collector Art House Discord. And um, some of the really higher end cards, like the Philosopher's Stone, the Keythera Mechanism, um, some of the Francesca Barald pieces like Eric's Curiosa, um, some of Elvira Shakarova's cards, uh, Dream Quest, these types of things. They can sell for one, two, three thousand dollars sometimes. Those are those are really big grail items. I think the top sale of an artist proof was about sixty five hundred dollars for one of the um, Philosopher's Stones by Severin Pinu. So these are really coveted. I mean, these are this is original art. It's like it's an it's truly an original painting, just on a smaller form, and it's on a card that numbers uh, with a population of 29. 25 from the Kickstarter, 25 given to the artist, and then four more to each of the four top Kickstarter supporters. So 29 in total. Uh, so the underlying card is very rare, and then every painting, of course, is a one of one. So that's a very special, um, nice thing to own. And then you get into the highest end art category. So we'll finish on original paintings in Sorcery Contested Realm. So there are 403 cards in Sorcery. There were some alternate artwork, some curios. So let's call it about 400, 420, 430 paintings um, that you would classify as alpha or alpha related. And um, original paintings have done phenomenally well. In the early days, the artists were selling these for... I would say, you know, $600 maybe on the very low end to upwards of 2,500, depending on the artist, depending on, you know, many factors, but the art market has really um, taken off. There, it's been, there's been multiple legs to the art market, just like the sealed product market, just like Alpha. So we've seen paintings on average, uh, most recently I'd say sell for anywhere from 5,000 to 8,000, I, I would say on average. Um, and then some of the, the larger, very high-end big time pieces, there's been several, um, many at this point, five figure sales of those. And uh, the, the largest sale on record, well, not quite on record because it was a private sale, I suppose, but the Avatar of Fire is one that I broke, uh, I brokered recently at a record price, which, which um, topped the previous record of the Sir Tristan, which is another um, sale I brokered on consignment. Those were handled privately uh, with open bids. I think the the top public auction, um, trying to think, it was probably after that, the Dream Quest. Uh, we auctioned at the community group and the Collect Art House Discord. That was right around 10,000, 10,500 maybe, 10,100. 
it was right around 10,000. I know it, it breached uh, five figures. Um, but again, the the novelty of uh, owning an alpha original piece is huge. Uh, the quality of the work in sorcery is phenomenal. And I think there's just a deep and growing appreciation for art in the game. Um, you know, there's there's pieces of all sizes, all different mediums, uh, stylistic differences. There's huge pieces like this is about three feet wide by four feet tall. The the Carchemish Chimera by Gadu Duasso. That's an original painting. Um, so some of these are tremendously valuable. Uh, they're really coveted. There's very high demand. And people think the market breadth is narrow based on looking at who's who's bidding on these. Um, but there's also been many direct sales directly from the artist, um, privately brokered sales. And I can tell you, there's pretty strong breadth for, for a brand new game. I think the, the number of people that own original paintings in sorcery is fairly widespread. Um, I think, you know, the creator of the game is certainly has the most pieces. And I think, um, maybe some of their employees that, um, collect art to some extent. Um, I have a pretty strong size collection myself i know there's a few other people like me that are super into the artwork as their primary collection category um, but beyond that most people i would say you know then you get to another tier where some people have a few or a handful of pieces and then a lot of people just have like one two three of their favorite that they really want hard on and one after on and that that's the nature of the market um you know when you have auctions you, you flush out who who really wants that piece right and they compete for it or some of the artists, you know, they, they understand the value of their work, um, the value in the context of the game, and they're really holding out for a um, fair open market price for their work. And they're either keeping it or they're being approached with very strong deals and they're deciding to sell. But it's been interesting. We'll see when we get into Arthurian Legends if those alpha price tears hold. Um, but there's already been several uh, alpha pieces sold for, for qu quite substantial sums, um, very comparable to alpha same price points as alpha so i think um, that signifies that there is a compelling art mar market in sorcery and um, at this juncture in the game there's a lot of optimism in the prospects of the game itself um, but there's just a lot of just natural intrinsic appreciation for art and you see that in the original painting sales the sales of uh, limited embellished print series uh, and artist proofs and alters, you know, I think what proves it most is alters, right? Because you have artists outside of the game who are painting uh, the highest quality, tremendous, amazing work comparable to uh, the sorcery artists, just same on, on par with what the sorcery artists have done for the game. And people are absolutely loving that and valuing it similarly, which um, I think is an irrefutable sign of actual art appreciation independent of the card or the rarity or scarcity of the card like you would have with an artist proof and it's really great to see um, something i'm really passionate about on this channel is supporting the artists showcasing the artists of sorcery who they are as people also their work within the game and beyond the game and then other artists you know that can do um paintings uh, altars of sorcery cards to appeal to the the sorcery fans, the sorcery art collectors, people that want to broaden their horizons into new stylistic uh, genres beyond that of the high-end fantasy of sorcery and the throwback 90s uh, vibe and style of sorcery artwork. All right, so that's it in a nutshell. Uh, video went a little longer than I, I thought. Thank you guys for watching. Please like and subscribe to the video. Please check out my link tree if you want to take a look at my Collector Art House Patreon at a different platforms. Come join the Sorcerer Community Facebook group. There's 4,100 people. It's the largest community-run uh, social platform in sorcery. And uh, the Collector Art House Discord, where you can talk openly and have uh, great, um, you know, positive or critical discussions about sorcery, the state of the market, speculation, uh, vet your frustrations, vet your excitement and enthusiasm for the game. Anything's fair game. Just be respectful and have fun together. And uh, thank you all for your support. Really appreciate it. Talk to you next time.